preserve cash and keep your doors open during COVID-19? Tonight, you're going to hear solutions and strategies that will help you preserve cash and keep your business alive. Hello and welcome everyone to the Startup Life Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, startup founder, coach, podcast host, and co-host of a popular monthly startup pitch event right here in beautiful Boston, USA, and it's called Founders Live Boston. And we're live right now on Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, and Twitch. Woohoo! How is everyone doing? I'm so happy to see you here. I hope you and your loved ones are staying healthy and strong. And I'm thrilled that you carved out time to tune in and up your founder game. Bravo. Those of you tuning in live, please introduce yourselves in the comment thread. Let folks know where you're hailing from and share your business name and websites with each other. Use this opportunity to expand your network by connecting with each other on LinkedIn too, because you never know where your next collaboration will come from. And if you know someone who would benefit from our delicious conversation this evening, please share the URL on your social media feed so other folks can join the fun. Thank you. So the theme for Startup Life Show is a problem shared is a problem halved. And tonight's guest is going to help you solve the cash flow during an economic crisis problem. Your questions and comments are important to us. So please pop them in the comment threads and we'll answer them live. Tonight, we have Michael Dermer joining us. He's an entrepreneur, lawyer, speaker, coach, author, and founder of the Lonely Entrepreneur Platform, a one-stop shop that understands the entrepreneur's struggle and provides solutions to the business and personal issues we all face as entrepreneurs. Michael founded his first company in 1998. It was a pioneer in the health rewards industry and Michael survived the harrowing experience <clears throat> of watching the company he built from the ground up almost get destroyed overnight by the financial crisis of 2008. Yikes. So let's give a round of applause and a hearty welcome to our featured guest, the magnificent Michael Dermer. Here you are, Michael. You've been showing right here the whole time. You know, this is so much fun to have you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So thrilled you're here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's great. I'm just going to say hi to a few folks before we get going. And we have Vicki O'Neill. Hey, Andy and Michael, looking forward to this conversation. Vicki is from the beautiful state of Ohio. And I, she's one of my favorite marketing people. She has a great marketing sales business that I treasure. And of course, we love Victoria Sherman. She's part of your team, right, Michael? She is. She is. He runs global operations for the Lonely Entrepreneur. Excellent. Yay, Victoria. And then Eric Cox joining in from Lawrence, Mass. Good evening. Hi, Eric. You always add value with your business media prepared, which is helping people command the moment. So we're ready to get going and have a delicious conversation. And listeners, I, or viewers, I really want you to take in this incredible story that Michael has to share tonight because we're all in this together. And Michael, fortunately, has been through some tough times already. So I'm confident that we're all going to grow and expand from his insights. But let's start off with your startup story, Michael. How did you end up, as I always say, why did you leave payroll <laughs> and the paycheck and join your own business and create a vision? Share with everybody your startup story. Thank you so much, Andy, for having me. Um, you know, I was a corporate lawyer. I was an M&A guy in New York City, uh, but I was looking to start a business. And unlike now where, you know, business plans are thrown on your desk every day, that didn't happen back then. So I was like looking for the business to start, but I was only attracted to things that were kind of big and strategic and literally stumbled upon it. Um, somebody said to me over dinner one night, uh, for every 10 pregnant women that don't follow their prenatal care, it cost the healthcare system a million dollars. And I was like, wait a minute. So if you just gave these 10 women $10,000 each, the system would save 900 grand. And somebody said yes. And that was, I'd like to say, the beginning of the end. And I used to sit there after doing M&A deals at midnight and business plan with my brother at my law firm. 
um, and then left a couple of years later and started what got to be known as the first company in the United States to uh, reward people for being healthy. Oh my gosh. And so there you were moving and grooving. You went, entered the 2000s and it's happening. You survived 9-11, hooray. And now mm -hmm. you're you know a good chunk of the way and you've built your business up to what, 60 million you had shared with yep. me and you had a significant amount of employees. Yeah, 500 employees at that time. Yep. Oh my gosh. And there you were. Tell everybody what it was like all of a sudden watching like dominoes, companies failing around you. Yeah, it's so surreal with what's going on. You know, from 2000 to 2005, you know, nobody was open to rewarding people for being healthy. I mean, they told us it would never happen. So we fought the typical, you know, startup battle, early stage, you know, in the early 2000s. But after, you know, a while we caught on grew like crazy from 2006 to 2008. So now we're almost 10 years into it. So we had, you know, made it, um, created a whole new category in healthcare. So we sat there in 2008 with some of the largest companies uh, in the world as customers, a software license business. Um, we had, you know, fought for what everybody fights for, which is, you know, get big customers and literally watched our company, you know, like you said, which had 500 employees almost get destroyed overnight. You know, our largest, the largest companies in America were our customers. And in fact, the three largest customers we had, Washington Mutual, Countrywide Financial, and General Motors, um, two of them don't exist today. And as we know, General Motors needed a government bailout. So yeah. our business that we built over 10 years literally got cut in half in about a week. One week? It wasn't like the slow process. It was like, boom. Remember what happened, you know, once Bear Stearns went down, the major financial institutions went down right around around them, and then and then people like General Motors, you know, were soon to follow. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, was watching. We would pick up the Wall Street Journal, and it'd be another company on the front page, and and it was one another one of our clients. Um, so it was pretty dramatic and pretty quick. <laughs> and so every day you had to get up and look your employees in the eye, Michael, your team in the eyes, going, uh, what yeah, was that yeah. like as the leader? <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's interesting because I had private equity investors at that time. My family had invested a lot of business, of course, as you said, employees um, and constituents. Um, and, you know, you'd be lying if you said that, oh, I'm just going to go home, sleep it off and I'll figure out an answer because, as you know, that math just doesn't work. Uh, and, you know, it's like it's like you're sitting on the beach, you know, reading the Wall Street Journal and there's a tsunami coming. You know, even though you're a decent sized company, a 500 place person company, it's nothing in the grand scheme of the financial system collapsing. So at that point, you know, you're you're really faced with, OK, there's no end in sight, like a lot of the way that people feel right now. What do you do? Um, and, you know, you kind of wallow in it for about 15 seconds and then you try to build a plan. Oh, my gosh. So, of course, I, you know, I want to go into details because a lot of business owners are going through this right now, whether you have a team of five or 500. Yeah. You still have to say to everybody, hmm, you know, I only have so much cash. So what were those conversations like? And as, as we all know, you were trained for economic collapse, crisis, leadership and management. You had to figure it out once you went through your hiding under the covers for a minute <laughs> and yeah. came back out. How, like, you know, how did you bring in an HR consultant to help you downsize? How did that work? Well, I mean, the one thing that I realized pretty, yes, I was formally trained. So I was an M&A lawyer and that really helped and a mm -hmm. finance guy. So that really helped. But that being said, the math still doesn't work. Right. And right. so you have to try to figure it out. Um, you know, for me, uh, there were two things that I did at the same time. Number one, I said to everybody, listen, um, does anybody believe that people won't reward people for being healthy in the future? And the answer was no, everybody was doing it at that point. And so the vision of what we were doing, everybody very much believed in. And that was important. That being said, people have families, they have healthcare costs, they have to pay the bills and things like that. Um, and so, you know, I sat down with our team um, and said to them, listen, we've got to make some tough choices. And just, but well, the one thing I told everybody was that forget about the rules, like don't kill anybody, don't break any laws. But other than that, drive the wrong way on a one way street, because no, none of the normal things are going to work in these economic times. Um, and so that really helped. And we applied that to everything. Um, now, Andy, you know, it, it led to a success and all the fun stuff. And it's easy for me to say right now, but I would be lying to you if I told you that at the time I quote unquote knew 
that all these things were working or would work. Um, when it came to employees, um, we just tried to be creative. We said, okay, we have a certain amount of money we have to get to. Um, and we did things that were wild. We divided jobs into three. We had people work for just health insurance. We asked people to, you know, if they were getting their health insurance from us to switch their spouse. I mean, everything, you know, we created incentive-based compensation. You know, we, we gave, you know, we just, we tried to do the best we could. You were very compassionate. Yeah, listen, these are people that, yeah. you know, as much as I lived and breathed this business, most of those people did as well. Yeah. Um, and they were just as upset about what was happening to the business as what was happening to them, which is really amazing to fear people to feel that way. And we just did whatever we could. The problem was that, you know, if somebody said to me, what's your revenue going to be tomorrow? We had no idea because all of the big companies in America were going under left and right. Right. So you tr what you do is you try to make your best guess, you build a plan, you try to make the changes that you have to make um, as a kind of a wartime CEO, but to do it with compassion and, and get up every day and move. Wow. So, and I'm thinking, of course, how you were telling everybody, think outside the box, go the wrong yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's one thing under great circumstances to get really innovative, but I guess it's that whole invention is the mother of necessity. Am I getting that right, everybody? <laughs> that quote? Is that no. what happened? Like what because you knew you had receivables, which you were feeling wonderful about, until yeah. that week hit. And then yeah. all of a sudden. Uh, yeah, there were there were so many examples of it. Um, I'll I'll give you a great one. A, a, one of the biggest things we did as a company is people would earn rewards for healthy behavior, like going to the gym or getting a mammogram. And one of the rewards they would get is gift cards from major retailers. So we had gift cards we would get from major retailers and we would buy them for, you know, 70 cents for a hundred dollars. And that's one of the ways we made money. Well, we had about $10 million of liabilities in gift cards that we were sending out and about a million dollars in cash. Yikes. So you don't have to be a math major to realize that that doesn't work. And so we said, okay, but wait a minute, every retailer in the country is struggling with getting customers to go in their doors. So we went to the corporate retailer groups of all the retailers we worked with and said, listen, we can't pay 80 cents on the dollar anymore. We got to pay 20 um, because, and we're going to put people in your stores, right? Some of them said yes. So that helped. So now we reduced, you know, $10 to $20 or, for, you know, $10 to $2, if you will. But then some didn't. So what we did was um, instead of going to, you know, Applebee's corporate, we went to Applebee's Northern New Jersey and said, listen, Corporate won't do this for us, but we want you to give gift cards to us for nothing. And because you don't have anybody coming in your restaurants anyway. Right. Yeah. So, so it was early Groupon. Early Groupon. So literally there were some stores that would say, we'll, we'll charge you $5 for $100. So we essentially took a, a $10 million liability and turned it into a $500,000 liability. And we had a million dollars in cash. So again, we probably broke a law or two. With with Applebee's, um, we probably would have got our hands slapped, but you know, you just you have to, and that's not the kind. Of, that's what we all have as entrepreneurs, right? We may not have capital and resources all the time, but we always have the ability to think differently. And I just said to everybody, I was like, we've got to come up with different ways because the normal ways are not going to work in this climate. Right, and your team responded. Yeah, they yeah. weren't and paralyzed. Just, <laughs> they weren't paralyzed, and frankly, a lot of the things you're paralyzed by with banks and financing and all stuff where you know you're just going to get in line with every place we're like forget it like doesn't even matter those aren't going to work so what are the other ways that we can get from point a to point b and we started just challenging ourselves without a lot of you know without a lot of belief that all these things would work Andy. it's not like you yeah. i knew when we walked into applebee's they'd be like sure um you just gotta you gotta do the best that you can and try to get to the the numbers while you know try, trying to keep everybody together and how, how many employees were you left with after everything was downsized? So it was about 350. Okay. Um, and a good, a good amount over that were part-time and mixed and mixed match. And we started bringing a lot of them back and stuff like that. So, um, you know, listen, we could have, we could have, we probably should have made more dramatic cuts, but we also just knew that, that this was a short-term thing. Um, it wasn't like the notion of people rewarding people for being healthy was going away because every company in America was doing it at that point. Yeah. 
Um, it's just, it's like Amazon. Amazon said nobody will buy a book in a store anymore and now they run the world. So it just <laughs> takes a little bit of, of forethought and vision That's and tremendous. stamina to, to do it. So. Well, and of course, if you could do it under that type of economic collapse, and again, people were still going to coffee shops, they were still able to go to yeah. Applebee's, yeah. but I think it's the method, it's the mind hack, it's the innovation and imagination yeah. mind hack that you gave everybody permission to throw yeah. up on a whiteboard and say, what if, what if, and just, you know, the answer is always gonna be no, unless you ask, and that's what you learned. Vicki has a great question here, let's bring it up. What was the pivotal moment that gave you a sigh of relief that things were going to be okay? I love that question, Vicki. It's a great question. Uh, there was no moment um, <laughs> because as you can imagine, every day there were things going on. I used to say, not to be too graphic, but I'd get kicked between the legs about 20 times a day. I just stopped noticing. Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So, <laughs> so I think honestly for me, what was really strange is about a year before that, Vicky, I got offered a obscene amount of money to sell the company. And I was like, why would we sell the company now? We've just made it and we've broken through. And arguably a year later, it was worth nothing. Oh my gosh. So, so for me, um, not spending any time on that was really the pivotal moment. Like I spent like a week on it and I was like, well, what does it matter? Like, what does that make a difference? And you really start to say, I'm going to build and execute a plan. Right. Um, and just like we've been, Andy, as you know, advising people now, thinking about the what if doesn't do you any good. You know, every moment, every piece of energy. So once you once you, once you build your plan, like I'm going to go. But there wasn't any moment along the way that you said, OK, we're going to make it. Don't get me wrong. When I walked out of Applebee's with a million dollar gift, a million dollars of gift cards that cost me 50 grand. Sure. That felt pretty good. <laughs> Um, but it was a lot of, it was a lot of singles and a lot of strikeouts. And so it wasn't any one moment. I wish there was. I know, but you made a really good point. Honest to gosh, we can beat ourselves up better than anybody, right yeah. folks? We can look in that mirror and go, you idiot. We could have been like sitting on the beach during this collapse for crying out loud, but no, you yeah. had to hold on to the business or you had to make this decision. Look, the horse has left the barn. <laughs> yeah. The, the more compassion that you can practice with yourself as a founder, the faster you can move on. And also folks, I highly recommend that you in the middle of all of this, and it's very emotional. And of course it feels very, very personal, but if you can step out and look at your business as I would look at it, or Michael would look at it and go, hmm, yep. then you remove that <laughs> choke hold yep. that you have on your, from your mindset, you become an observer. And you bring your team in and you make sure your team isn't thinking about, oh, my God, we're all going to die and they're going to run out into the streets. You know, you've got to make sure that they're sitting there and going, OK, as an observer, how do I do this? Yep, And I would I would add to that, um, Andy, if you believe you're supposed to be the leader and if you have C next to your title, it's not your job to be emotional. It doesn't matter that it's your business. Right. It's your job to lead and build a plan and execute. So even though it is very personal, all of us. Um, that's not the job. And if you think you're as good as you think you are, which all of us have talent to be able to start something entrepreneurial, it's your job to to buck up. It's big boys and girls stuff. Um, understand that you're we're human, uh, but at the same time, that's not the job. The job is is to build a plan and execute a plan and give yourself the best chance of success. And, and one more from Vicky here. It's great that you were able to get up every day, take the punches and keep moving forward, not just for you and the company, but also for your employees. It shows great character as a leader. Absolutely. So let's bring Thank up. You. Yes, let's bring up Eric's question. What was the thing or things you learned about yourself during these times of crisis? Other than, you know, you've got to see after your name so you can't be emotional. Um, I, I think more than anything, was was calm and creativity. Um, I think that, you know, I was a college baseball player and the one thing you learn in college baseball is that when you're a hitter, you fail seven out of 10 times, even when you're right. great. And you have to go to the plate. And at the moment you're supposed, you should be the most tense. You have to be the most relaxed, right? When someone's throwing a 90 mile an hour fastball at you. And you started to realize that, that it is the ability to be calm, that everybody's watching you, um, but then it's really those creative juices, those entrepreneurial juices, um, really have to start to flow. And so what I learned was, is when, you know, when you kind of 
on, you know, kind of change your perspective um, about the way you think about things. Um, and you start to think things about differently. That's what I really learned about myself was that if you could just chill out, right, understand that you had to lead, um, but then, okay, your job's to be the strategist, right? Your job, think about how many times all of us as entrepreneurs, we think, say to ourselves, we never get to think. We're just doing it. And, and strategy is ultimately a win. So you say to yourself, you know, for me, if strategy really wins, then, then I learned that during that time, that's the time you needed it most because the train wasn't just going to be on the rails. It was going to, it was off the rails and you had to come up with strategies to do that. So I just learned that, that strategy becomes the most important thing. And obviously during those times, like me walking to Applebee's is not something that jumped off the page, right? It took a little thinking. Um, people were like, what are you going to do? Um, and so that's what I think what I learned just how important strategy is to actually making a difference. And, and again, being able to chill in the face of a crisis. So you learned that about yourself too. Yeah. Um, so now you've got all this learning that you've had, which is just yeah. so tremendous. And you're on the other side and you've sold the business. Then you yeah. launched the lonely entrepreneur. So before we get into any of the cash flow strategies that we're going to talk about, share a little bit about, why you ended up launching The Lonely Entrepreneur. Yeah, so after the business almost collapsed, you know, we battled for a couple of years, as you know, Andy, and then you know, we started to stabilize and grow again. And on the other end of the 2008 financial crisis, everybody was interested in healthcare. We got approached by some investment bankers and got bought, and it worked out great. It was an amazing yeah. story. Um, you know, that was an incredibly intense number of years, as you can imagine. Um, we went from saving the company to selling it. Uh, so I wasn't doing anything. I was in New York City chilling, um, uh, reconnecting with family and friends, counting some money, thanking employees, like doing the stuff you do after you sell a business. And I literally was just helping entrepreneurs for fun in the city, um, friends, friends of friends. And one of them said to me, being an entrepreneur is really lonely. And I was like, okay, didn't think much of it. Uh, and a friend of mine dragged me into Starbucks one day and goes, watch this and yells, who here is a lonely entrepreneur? And everybody raised their hand. And I was like, okay. And then what really hit me was, huh, this all makes sense now. Mm -hmm. The whole world is working on their passion. The whole world is, is struggling and trying to be better. What better way? You know, I told you, I was always interested in big strategic things. What better way than to wake up every day than to try to give people a better chance of success in their passion? Um, and that was what led to starting the, uh, the Lonely Entrepreneur. Oh, great comment here from Jen. Great insight and pearls of wisdom from a wartime CEO. Good discussion during uncertain times. More entrepreneurs need to hear this for encouragement and motivation. Jen, you are absolutely right, uh, in, especially in really understanding how you have to remove the emotion yeah. from the experience and make some really hard decisions. Just yeah. want to remind everybody, we are live on Facebook and YouTube and Periscope and Twitch, and your comments are so important to us. We're going to move into the segment of the show now that is about cash, because when you're in the middle of an economic collapse and crisis, which we are right now, you have to figure out how are we going to make this work? And one of the the most important things that I've heard you, by the way, Michael, say several times on Instagram stories, et cetera, don't ever let anyone tell you there's not a way. Yep. Well, listen, I think if you follow all the rules in times like this, you have no chance, right? And the one thing that we all as entrepreneurs do all the time is we come up with different solutions that other people don't think about. And that's as much as we don't have as much money in the bank when we start businesses, we absolutely have that. And there are so many times where um, you're faced with a situation where if you just kind of look at it and say, oh, look at it the way everybody else looks at it, um, there's no way you'll win. Um, we have the ability to come up with different solutions and there is always a way. It can always be done differently and no one should ever tell you otherwise, especially with, you know, if you have the entrepreneurial talents to be able to start something unique. I mean, many companies I know their revenue has gone down significantly yeah. 50 60 yeah. 70 80 90 percent some people just yeah. flatlined yeah. so let's talk about how do we preserve cash how do we have conversations first of all let's talk a little bit for those who have investors did you have investors 
in your I did. I did. I had very sophisticated private equity investors at the time. And, and so what were the conversations that you had with them and what was your communication style with them, Michael? Um, boy, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I would say, you know, listen, it's very big boys and girls stuff at that point. Significant money invested. Um, people aren't happy and and it doesn't really matter why people are unhappy. Um, you know, I had very, very direct conversations mm -hmm. with them. I was like, I'm, I'm not going to get into what ifs. I'm going to build a plan. I'm going to bring you a plan about what I'm going to do. Anybody wants to jump up and down, yell, scream, run around naked, that's not what you're going to get from me because that doesn't produce the result, which is, you know, revenue, cash expenses and things like that. But there are a lot of, you know, when you're a CEO, you always take responsibility. You know, people say to me, even today, and I, and I cringe a little bit, well, Michael, there's no way you could have known the financial cri but crisis could have happened, but that's your job. Right, your job is to be out in front of that. So I never felt that, and so I always felt responsible for it. Um, but you know what? The conversations with investors are going to be like, like I'm going to go from this point to that point. Um, people may be unhappy, of course, when investments or don't look like they're going well. You know, as I said, Andy, I think I've told you before. You know, the day before I sold my company, I was a moron. The next day, I was brilliant. And oh, you know, a two two months earlier, you know, in a in a board meeting we were jumping up and down about how profitable the company was and how we were the market leader. And then all of a sudden, two months later, I'm a complete idiot. So right. I just said, listen, I'm not gonna invest in any of that. I was invested as anybody because my family invested a lot of money. Sure. Um, and I just said, we're gonna, we're gonna plan. We're gonna plan and execute and that's the only thing we can do. And did you have any investors that wanted to come in and roll up their sleeves with you? Or did you have to manage them in a certain way to make sure that they, I got yeah. that. I really had to manage them because you you have to, you know, Andy, there's a lot of different constituents that you're trying to serve. And so those constituents sometimes, especially in times of crisis, don't always line up together, right? So somebody, an investor might say, well, why wouldn't you cut your employees more, right? Or So, so I, to me, I put them in a process. I said, mm -hmm. every two weeks, we're going to get on a call. We're going to go through exactly where we are. Don't call me every day because that doesn't advance the result. Um, I'm going to give you my plan and I'm going to tell you the decisions. I want your feedback, of course. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm going to decide um, what's in the best interest of the different constituents of mm -hmm. the company. Remember, Andy, there were times we had to go to customers and fire customers and say, we can't service you anymore because you're not profitable. And before it was fine and now it's not because the numbers don't work. There were a lot of moving parts. Yeah. And you don't have the time to invest in ego or personality or whatever. It's just like, I'm going to build a plan. I'm going to look for your feedback. Uh, I'm going to make decisions and go and hold me accountable for the results. Okay. So founders, I just want you to take this in. Those of you who have investors, you really need to put your leadership hat on big time or Tierra. Yeah. You need to give them clear directions on how you're going to be communicating, what you expect from your investors. and keep focused on your business. It is your business. They have money in your business. You, it's a terrible feeling to lose an investor's money, of course. However, they are big boys and girls. They are not widows and orphans. They understand it's a risk, but it, so, so many of them might want to get into the weeds. So do what Michael suggests, create a communication channel that is yeah. going to work with specific dates. This is what we're going to go over. This is what I need from you. So that's terrific advice. And so for many of you right now, you might be negotiating with some of your vendors. I know I negotiated with our car loan people, and I know that 2008 has really paved the way for how well I believe vendors in our personal life are responding and perhaps in the business world, how vendors are responding. I, there's a lot of understanding that we're in this together. So Michael, let's talk about negotiating with vendors when you've only got a few bucks left in the bank and you're trying to keep the doors open. This is a really important strategy founders. So I want you to tune in on this. Yeah, so remember the ultimate arbiter is cash, right? Cash is everything, cash coming in and cash coming out. So again, I'm, I'm not gonna say you're gonna ignore your legal agreements or your obligations or even your moral obligations that you feel you have, but at the end of the day, you're the steward of the business, right? So you have to try to figure out where does the cash come in and cash come out? So a couple of things that are a little bit easier. 
number one, in, in this time, there are certain companies that are basically giving you a free pass. So if you have a mortgage, right? Um, many, many of the banks are saying 90 days, right? You don't have to pay. Remember, um, do that in your personal business, you know, do that in your personal life as well as your business life, you know, in your business life, you know, lenders don't have an obligation to, to let you slide for 90 days. Um, but in your personal life, they do on mortgages, right? Many of them are mortgages, same thing on credit cards. So, so there's just things that are programs that are being put in place when it comes to, you know, other types of vendors, like, like your landlord, right? Uh, a mortgage you might have or a loan you might have. Um, at the end of the day, it's just cash. And mm-hmm. so, you know, our recommendation has always been from the beginning of this, stop paying everything, like start at zero, um, and then negotiate one by one with your vendors uh, and the communication to vendors, um, which is certainly very understandable. And I think, Andy, there are a lot of vendors that understand that we're in this together, but a lot don't, is this is where we are. I need your help. Sue me if you want to sue me. <laughs> Doesn't really matter, right? Um, and you go into it and you get into a dialogue and say, listen, I need you to help me work through this. Um, it sounds a little bit weird, but you're to a certain extent negotiating from a position of strength because if they think you're not going to pay them, right? They could. It doesn't matter what they do, right? right? If you're a five-person restaurant and you're not in business, anymore, you're like, it doesn't matter because until I get customers back, so you really have to be a little bit bold about it. Now, obviously, everybody's legal situation is a little bit more, is a little bit different from others. But I would be going back to every single vendor and first and foremost being asked for 90 days to pay nothing. Yep. Right. And, and this is where it's the survive and thrive. I would be going back to them and restructuring our deals going forward. Right. So if I'm paying a hundred dollars for something, I would say, not only do I want 90 days of nothing, I want to pay $50 for that hundred dollars. So you're setting yourself up for the future. Yep. Um, now, some vendors will say no, some vendors will say yes. But if you really look at, at the leverage you have kind of in a post-COVID world, if you're a tenant and, and you have a landlord, the last thing that landlord wants is for you to leave. Because how are they going to get another tenant in six months when this is done? So you have to use this kind of leverage points of, and, of course, relationships that you have. Um, and then you have to work through your vendor list from the bottom up and say, number one, what is completely essential? Even if they're essential, you should be negotiating with them. Yeah. And right? now you're an attorney. So, of course, you automatically think, how can I negotiate on this? Right. <laughs> What's your advice for folks who are don't have that strong negotiation background? Yeah, I think that um, certainly, you know, the, the roadmap that I just laid out is pretty straightforward. Um People just don't be scared by you're the worst person in the world. I'm going to sue you. Like just, just go in and state your case. The other thing too is, you know, there's, there's people that can help you. Like, so there's a lot of people, um, you may have a friend who's a lawyer, a friend who's an accountant or a finance guy or gal that'll, that'll kind of step in and have a conversation with you that will understand some of the things that, you know, that I've been sharing with you here today. So, but I would go to all of them. Uh, no, nobody can, turn on a TV or open up a newspaper or watch online and not understand what's going on. So you have that kind of in your arsenal, but you really do have to, your real arbiter has to be cash. Forget about what the legal agreement says. I mean, obviously if you have like personal guarantees on loans, you know, that's a little harder. Um, But short of that, I think that you, you, your job is to preserve cash. And if you can get through the next period of time, um, there's opportunities to make it back. The other thing I would say is, and this sounds a little counterintuitive, is if you give some vendors a little cash today, they may give you great deals going forward. Right. Yep, a little act of, of faith on your part. Yep. Act of faith, and frankly, they need they need cash as well. And viewers, I'm gonna pull be pulling up a cash flow statement, which I'm gonna have available for everybody. And after we go through some of these other uh discussions regarding cash flow. I'm going to pull it up. I'm going to talk about how you're going to start at zero and you've yep. got that 90 days and what, you know, what you should be paying, what you can't, you know, can you negotiate this where and how you're going to put the numbers in so that you can really understand how cash flows through your business and a cash flow spreadsheet is something that you founders, 
If you don't know how to use, find a way to understand and up yeah. your game around the cash flow statement. You don't have to pull all the numbers together. Your accountant or bookkeeper can help you with that. You have to know how money flows in your to your business and out of your business. Now, we've now we talked about how to manage our vendors. I always have to bring, you know, having been a Hey, I don't know if you noticed everybody, I've got my pinstripe blue uh, banker blazer on tonight. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was a banker back in the day. Lines of credit. I mean, they can call their line of credit anytime any, because banks lend based on ratios. And if they start seeing, you know, that ratio from assets and liabilities out of balance, receivables and payables out of balance, they're going to be calling that loan. How do you negotiate with the banker? Yeah, I think that when it comes to working with financial institutions um, these days, more than ever, especially when it comes to things like mortgages and uh, some, you know, some loans, a lot of the anything that's a lender that's SBA lender is having restrictions that are put on them where they where they're not allowed to right go ahead and and foreclose on things. But you really got to get into a negotiation with them. Um, they a lot of these lenders don't want to foreclose. Um, they want to try to work with you. I mean, think about it. Mortgage companies are giving you 90 days for nothing, right? With no interest and no principal. So um, I think you do have to go in and have candid conversations with them. Now, you may find that some slice of your vendors say no. You know, some say yes, some may say no. And that's where the cash management side partly is negotiation, but partly then is tapping into some of the SBA programs. And then I'm happy to share. There's some other creative things that people are doing to actually generate and raise cash. Well, let's um, talk about that, Michael. Sure. Um, now, obviously, these don't apply to everybody, and and everybody's familiar with the, you know, economic injury program and the paycheck protection program, and those are obviously really nice, viable vehicles that people are going after, which help. Um, but there's other things you can do. Um, there are zero percent interest credit cards, right? So there are credit cards where literally for 15, 18, 21 months, you pay no interest, right? So you could take $20,000 and go get a 25,000 line of credit on a credit card and transfer that $20,000 and not have to pay it for 15 or 18 months. Um, you can also, if you happen to be fortunate enough to have equity in your home, right? There's things that you can do to refinance your mortgage, to add additional home equity credit lines, you know, on top of that, um, where you're basically just, you know, taking dollars out of your out of your home and, and have it kind of sustain your business for a while. There's also opportunities to use 401ks in ways that you weren't able to use before. But you know, the thing about the credit cards and the homes is you have the well, a way to generate additional cash. And so many times, you know, with us as entrepreneurs, it's all boiled together. Like it's right. not the business. The business will, yeah, the business will pay you back. But I want to bring something up that you start the whole conversation with, which is you saw how you would be viable after the economic collapse, got its act together. Yeah. You know, you've got to be smart about your business. You've got to be able to see that you do have a pathway to profitability. Again, you're just looking to get through the six, nine month, maybe 12 month period, maybe hovering, maybe, you know, give yourself that time to come up with creative ideas to pivot. But honestly, founders, you got to know that if it, there is no, if life, the landscape has changed so significantly, yeah. You're not an airline who can hang out. I mean, they're talking three years before they're going to see the kind of thing going on for them. You may have to call it quits. Okay. So give that a really hard thought and also understand what you have an appetite for and your partner. So if your spouse or the person who's sharing life with you is like, oh, hell no, <laughs> not touching yeah. the mortgage, not touching the 401k, then you have to have those conversations. Blair Glazer is tuning in here and um, there she is. She knows how to help people have great conversations and helps teams. And she's a great executive coach and does many wonderful things in the world. But she'll be the first to also say, you've got to have those financial discussions with your loved ones because not all our loved ones have an appetite for the risk that we can tolerate. So yeah. you may have to make those decisions, but based on the landscape over the next nine to 12 months, if you can see your business, if you can just hang in there, then Michael's advice is tremendous because what it is, is you are investing in your business. You're leveraging credit card debt. You're using debt to do that. You're paying yourself 
interest if you have a 401k because your spouse work is working for someone with a 401k and so you're able to peel that off and you're just going to pay yourself back and and all so they are very creative ways what other ways can we as founders find cash and find ways to stay alive and keep the doors open michael yeah, yeah so so all the components you're talking about and you're so right you know when i say you got to build a plan that plan's got to have cash management, revenue, expense. Um, and so when you think of all of those different things together, right? So we're talking a little bit about the pure, you know, preserve cash type of stuff. You should be filing for business interruption insurance, right? Or on a claim if you have a mm -hmm. business interruption claim. Um, keep in mind, most of those policies, they're gonna deny you at first, but there's states coming out right now with laws that's saying they're gonna have to be covered. So you do things like that, right? You're renegotiating your expenses. You're taking advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL. And, and you know, to the question before that somebody asked, you know, there's not a lot of home runs in this. There's a lot of singles that add up over time. Um, you take a little bit of these different techniques. You are reducing your employee expenses, right? And trying like you to said, like you said earlier. I mean, maybe there's a few other startup founders that you know who could share, <laughs> or as you Absolutely. said, kept somebody on for the insurance only. Absolutely. Right. Um, the, there's opportunities to get um, free resources now, as you can imagine. Um, there's college kids that are at home. And mm -hmm. so you got to be super creative about how to get the resources that you need to have. And then probably most importantly is on the revenue side, right? On the revenue side of the business, you know, how is it going to look when things start to calm down? How does it look now, frankly? Um, you know, if you think about somebody, if you're, a, if you're doing home construction, you know, you should be shifting your business to work on home offices for people when they're stuck at home, right? If you're, we were kidding around with somebody um, who had a hair salon and we're like, wait a minute, everybody's sitting at home with long, ugly hair, like get online and charge 20 bucks to have your kid cut your hair online. Like, like just make it up, like add value, just add value in, in different ways. And ultimately, it is going to be a much different world. So when you sequence and you say, okay, my plan has these components, it, it's almost like you're running a charity event, right? Sure. You And I have ticket sales, I have the bar, I have the entertainment, I have the giveaway. Like you have to say, okay, first thing I have to do is preserve cash. I got to take it, hoard it, not pay it, negotiate everywhere I can, get access to the new programs there, be creative like with home equity and credit cards. Okay, now I'm doing cash. Okay, now I got to actually reduce my expenses, right? How do I be creative with employee cloud costs and still be compassionate? How do I negotiate with all my vendors? Mm -hmm. And then you take the revenue side and you say, how is it that I'm going to generate revenue? The way I did it today may not be the way I do it tomorrow. And that again, requires that great uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial creativity. Right, which is stepping out of your, oh my God, we're all gonna die <laughs> and becoming yeah. the observer and putting it out like that. and. Yeah, generating cash. So we're seeing people pivot and make changes in their business model. Um, I was part of the Techstars Startup Weekend, which was all virtual. And yeah. the ideas that were coming out, one of them was how to to help folks with their leases. So yeah. maybe your company, you've got a company over here that's ready to roll and, and this is a great time for them they could yep. take over your lease. How do you make all of that happen? So yep. those are great conversations, but finding those opportunities for cash. And I know Michael, I'm sure has generated some ideas for you to really think, okay, so we've been locked into the vision of our business doing this. Well, what if we went over here and what would our customers like? And is there room for us to wiggle this way and wiggle that way? Yeah, I think, I think Andy, um, the way I would think of it is what, are the needs that people have now that are different than the needs before COVID, right? So when you think about your business, it's not just your business, right? It's saying like, like we all should, what are our customers need? What do people out there need right now? And so you might have to say, okay, I did this a certain way, but I've got, you know, a bunch of college kids that are at home. I've got everybody sitting around the house. I've got, like, what do people need and how is that maybe related to my business? Um, maybe not right, right next to it. Um, you know, we were just working so with somebody the other day that's doing 
physical therapy online in a great way. Yeah. Um, a gentleman that ran um, sports camps for kids, of course, can't do that, but now is not limited by the fact that he only has, can allow 50 kids in. Now he can have 500 kids in an online session. Um, and so he went out and we got him a, a professional athlete. And now he's making more money than he was making before because he's not limited by the physical physical space. So there's always a way. Andrew Beaver, that's you. It's the founder I know. Hey, I, I had a nonprofit hire me to do a, an a, online event for them because yeah. they couldn't do their annual fundraiser in their usual place and the show had to go on. So there's, yeah. there's so many creative solutions. One thing that really helps founders is to have a plan. Even if yeah. the plan doesn't work out, it yeah. relieves stress when you're like, okay, these are the action steps we're going to take today, the yeah. next 10 days, the next 30 days. Let's talk about that, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the biggest tendencies um, is to focus on the emotion of it and the what if. Um, and as you can imagine, there's not a lot of answers to the what if where you go, oh, we're going to be great right? It's always going to be hard and stressful. And so the key to the whole thing is, you know, the, the, the plan will require your best during these times. Make no mistake. Um, and I'm rattling off things like they're easy. Cash, revenue, expenses, people. These are all big things. Um, I, here's what I would say. Um, every minute you spend not on executing, you know, building and executing your plan makes you a bad entrepreneur. Right, it's just, that's where you need to spend your time. Any minute that you spend not on your plan should be spent on time for you, right? When you get away from it, you, you know, we, we're human, so we always need a release. Um, when you get away from it, you have to get away from it, right? If you're gonna go watch a movie, if you're gonna go spend time with your kids, don't think about the business. If you're gonna think about the business, go sit at your desk, okay? Yeah. When you get When you get away, get away. And when you sleep, sleep. Right, it doesn't do you any good, right? To stare at the ceiling and say, what if? So it creates, it, it requires an incredible amount of discipline, but Andy, you're right on. When you wake up every day saying, okay, my plan's not gonna be perfect. There's gonna be risk in everything I do, but today I'm gonna talk to these three vendors and I'm gonna ask my clients to pay me a little differently and I'm gonna try to give it, like that's when your effort is giving yourself the best chance of success. That's right, and also, don't go down a rabbit hole for too long. If it really becomes clear that there's no pot of gold at the end of that, boom, go to the next one. Don't <laughs> delay too long hanging out in that. Um, and optimizing cash, you know, this whole trying to understand how, you know, how am I going to do payroll? How am I going to pay this? I'm going to keep the lights on, keep the internet access. Any yep. thoughts around optimizing the cash? And then I'll pull up the cash flow statement. Yeah, I think more so than anything, it's it's when it's all these levers that you're pulling at the same time, right? So a lot of times you have to start when you start at zero and you take all your available cash and hopefully you can augment that with some of the programs that are out there and some of the other things that we're talking about. You literally have to prioritize, negotiate, right? And making and make sure that you're only giving cash out for the right things. When it comes to cash coming in, you may have situations, for example, like I did in 2008, where you have large companies that owe you money or that pay you may have customers that pay you regularly so things that you can do you know uh, change your billing from you know at the end of the month to the beginning of the month you know bill in the beginning of a quarter versus the end of a quarter go to your customers and say to them um and listen they may be in the same position that you're yeah, they in. may be negotiating with you 100 <laughs> percent. go to your customers and say listen for for you owe me $25,000 for 10,000. I'll take $10,000 today, but I'll give you four months of free services. Right. So, so cash is everything. Such and the way thing. you, the way you package things and, and don't get me wrong. Some of these things won't work all the time. They will work with one customer and not with another customer. Um, so on the optimizing cash chat, especially as you manage it and it's coming in, right. You've got to always think about them. Right. When you go to a customer, think about them, not them relative to you. Right. But them relative to the problems that you're having. If you go to them and say, like we were working with an accounting firm that does, you know, accounting work and all their clients are at risk and going through the same stuff. And I was like, 
well, why wouldn't you help them with the pay tech protection program? Like help them file. They're like, well, that's what we do. But you're like, so what? It helps them. Right. And, and creating you goodwill. Yeah. You're creating goodwill. And, and, and in this case, it's not only creating goodwill, but generating money for them. So wake up and say to yourself, my customer is not just going to pay me because they like me. They're not just going to pay me because I provided the value yesterday. They're more likely to pay me. Imagine this. Imagine if you, you brought one of your customers a client, right? That has nothing to do with your business. Right. You run a yoga, you run a yoga studio and you bring them a, a social media client. You know, think about, think, think about what does your customer value? What could your customer get? And if you do that, as a function of that, you go higher up on that priority list in right. terms of, of cash. I get you. That's probably my most favorite piece of advice you've given, Michael, because we're innovative founders, we're creative thinkers, yeah. and our customers may not be thinking that way right now. If you see yeah. opportunity to help them build their business so that they can pay you, don't be stingy. <laughs> Yeah. Help collaborate, see how you can work together. Maybe you know someone else that's in the parallel with you. Collaborate with them. Find ways to make this work and think outside that proverbial box and reimagine. And if that you know requires some kind of exercises on your part, do it. The other piece of advice I'm I'm thinking, Michael, if you like I am from a certain generation. We're always told to be really nice and polite and pay your bills on time and all of that. You know, get to a different place because this business of yours is like your child or your pet. I mean, it is a precious treasure in your life. And while we're not going to be emotional about it, you also need to do what's best for your business. And sometimes that means that you're going to be very firm in your conversations. And of course, Feel free to call Blair Glazer <laughs> if you need help on having those difficult conversations. She is hands down the best to help you even role play before you go in to the conversation so that you can be firm but fair. Right, Michael? Yeah. And I think that, you know, at the end of the day, your responsibility is to the business, right? To your vision and also to your other constituents. And so you have to work back from cash. And so, you don't really have a choice but to, um, you know, go in and, and ask for what you want to ask for. Um, it is really good that people take moral obligations and legal obligations as seriously as we all do. But um, these are drastic times, yeah. um, and you don't really have a choice. Uh, if everybody just kind of paid their thing, right, paid their bills the way they normally did, nobody would be in business right now. So right. Um, it just doesn't work. Uh, and so you try to be thoughtful. Like you said, you try to be firm but fair, but at the same time, you also have to be able to negotiate a little bit to, to see, see a path for your business forward. Right. So, folks, I'm going to how I'm going to bring up the ca a cash flow projection because I really want to walk through this. So let me just do a quick screen share here, everybody, and get this pulled up. Okay. Everybody can see this here, right? So I'm going to just walk through just a little here because this is this is where you're going to start. Of course, you're going to change the date, obviously, but you're going to start at zero and you're going to put in well, what what sales can I see coming in this month? And you be very, very conservative. And if it's zero, it's zero. That's the landscape right now. And then look at all these other costs you have going down here. You know, what can you not pay right now? And you want to start off with this blank sheet. You want to go through and say, okay, you know, what are the things that I can push out 90 days out to here? And where can I negotiate? Who can I negotiate with, et cetera? Okay, this is like such an important document for you. I'm going to have the link in the show notes for those of you who are watching later. I'm going to pop the link to this cash flow projection for you folks who are watching live and really think about this on where can you pull back? What are the benefits that you're working in? And, you know, that's another thing, uh, Michael, I, you know, we live in Massachusetts, so there's options, a lot of options for healthcare in this wonderful Commonwealth. What, how do folks deal with that? How do vent, how do business owners deal with that particular line item? 
You know? Sorry, I just lost you for there for that one second. And oh, that's okay. So I'm I'm talking about healthcare. I mean, that's a tough thing to keep going with your business, right? I mean, you you're paying Blue Cross Blue Shield or somebody a ton of money. How do you keep that going when you know I don't know about that, and I. I think he has some connectivity challenges there. Did, so I don't know if you heard that, but I'm just putting it out there. Maybe some people, you know, can know that answer in the threads. Um, I don't know, but I think that's going to be a tough one. Paying your insurance tab uh, is never an easy thing. So I'm going to throw the link to this cash flow projection into the um, common threads, everybody. But I, I just, invite you, please, 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 to play with this as part of your action plan. It really, it really, really will create an opportunity for you to, for you to be less anxious. Trust me, even though, even, I don't care. Numbers are numbers, you can figure it out. You're a CEO and you're a founder. Founders can do hard things, right, Michael? Absolutely. <laughs> But I just think it's so important that you have this document and you figure this out. Michael, you have helped us. I know so many well, who are watching now, who are watching later, have a better idea of how they can have the vision. I think um, I saw something here from Blair Glaze. I just want to pull this up as opposed to the limited thinking that panic inspires. <laughs> You know, we yep. really have to use our vision and yep. keep inspiring everybody around us. Practical optimism works really well right now. How can we um, support you and the Lonely Entrepreneur and the initiatives that you're doing? And I know you've got some great, great uh, free classes going on right now and support for founders to help them get through this whole what expenses to pay, how to preserve cash, et cetera. But tell folks more about how we can support the lonely entrepreneur and add value for you. Well, uh, thank you, Andy. I mean, we wake up every day, the whole team at Lonely Entrepreneur, just trying to help as many entrepreneurs as we can through, in the, through this time. Um, unfortunately, as you know, we know way too much about this. Um, yeah. And uh, we. so what we did is we created um, a, a free resource called the Entrepreneur Survival Guide. And this is the very specific steps. We've just touched on a few here that run across how to plan, how to deal with the emotion, cash, revenue, expenses, communication, how to take care of yourself, everything. Um, and it's free to everybody. So uh, everybody can just go to lonelyentrepreneur.com. There's a big button up top called 2020 Survival Guide. Um, and if they go there, um, they can sign up for free. Um, and you know, we're just trying to help and that so all we got, as you know, Andy, um, not only is learning lessons and tools and things like that, but it's access to our online community and our weekly fireside chat. So on Friday at noon Eastern time, and you'll see this in the guide, we do a fireside chat much like this in which lots and lots of entrepreneurs get on and we cover a different topic each week nice. um, as, as well as take, um, uh, take comments from individual entrepreneurs. So Andy, right now, our whole thing is like, how can we help people get through this time? Beautiful. Well, I mean, it's and it's in your nature. I know that about you. You know, I've known you for a while now and you really do come from a sincere place of wanting to help, but you're also really good and capable to help. <laughs> and oh, that's, that's a lot. Sweet. That's a, no, it's a great, it's a great combination. And um, am I still doing the cash flow projection stream there. Oh my gosh, you guys, hopefully I wasn't, but anyway. Nope. <laughs> okay, Vicki. Yeah. So I'll, Vicki, I'll have it in the show notes on YouTube. Vicki was just saying YouTube doesn't share the links. I know, um, but I'll put it in the show notes for the um, folks watching later and for you to grab it off the YouTube video. Um, I have all the links for Michael as well, how to follow him and the Lonely Entrepreneur on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn for both the business and for Michael. You've seen his name going by at the bottom here, email. You know, we're all in this together. And seriously, you can go to thelonelyentrepreneur.com and really feel like somebody is there to support you and giving you the tools that you need as a founder during this really difficult time. Um, Founders, you know how I feel about you tuning in. 
I got to tell you, you know, now or later, this is really, really important that we stick together during this time and support each other and add wind to each other's sales. For those of you who tuned in tonight, thank you for carving out the time to uh, share the wisdom with us and share this experience with us. I know I'm confident that Michael planted a few seeds, if not for you, for someone you know who is going through a difficult time with their business right now. And if you have any questions for Michael or me and would like to continue the conversation, please reach out via email or pop your comments in the uh, comment thread and your questions into the comment thread. And for those watching the recording, please click the subscribe button and click on the bell icon, icon so that you're alerted every time I post a new video. Thank you. And please subscribe to my monthly newsletter. Let's stick together. <clears throat> I'm always sharing great advice as well as some of the podcasts that I host and these live stream events. If you need a pitch deck reviewed or help creating a pitch deck, I have raised millions from VCs, thousands from angels, and I co-host a monthly pitch event here in Boston, and I'm a judge at a lot of pitch events. So I can help you get that deck ready for investors and especially the type of investors that you want to be aligned with. And I can help you get ready for your next pitch event. So reach out to me. And of course, as we were just saying with the lonely entrepreneur, do not go this alone. You don't have to, and it's not good for you. I'm here for you and can hold your hand through a startup founders mentoring session. You can schedule an emergency call with me. I charge by the minute. There's a lot we can get done in 30 minutes, okay? And I'll help restore you and your business to, if not a completely healthy condition, into a place where you can take those next action steps that are so important right now. Next Tuesday, May 5th at 7 p.m., we're bringing business and mindset hacks you need to thrive in this new market with Mandela Shoemaker Hodges Dixon, the phenomenal female founder and CEO of Founder Gym, the first and leading online program to train under representative, represented founders on how to raise money and build sustainable and profitable businesses. I'm telling you, in three years, less than three years, really, Founder Gym has helped founders from 22 countries raise over 43 million. So be sure to join my meetup group, Startup Life Live, to receive alerts about next events. I'll have that in the show notes. Michael, 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 thank you so much for joining me this evening and creating this great piece of content for founders. It's just going to benefit them for months, if not years to come. Well, thank you so much, Randy, for having me and for all the work you do um, to help. And like you said, we're always available here any way, shape or form. They want to reach out and uh, anything we can do to help them, you know, through this time. Who wouldn't want to get advice from Michael? I'm, I'm serious. I mean, he, you get that he's been through this, right? Yeah, he really, it's wonderful. Thanks again, Michael. And viewers, until next time, please stay strong, stay focused, stay home until we can go back out again and stay healthy. And yes, remember, founders can do hard things. So you've got this. Cheers, everyone. Great to see everybody. Yay. I'm just going to bring up a few comments right here. This has been incredible. Thank you both. This is what I needed to hear. Great resources too. Yay, Eric. And Victoria, thanks so much for helping entrepreneurs overcome. Wonderful. The struggle. Blair. Yay. Thank you. Best person right here. I'm telling you folks, difficult conversations. Seriously getting a script. It's a great help. <laughs> Can you tell I that, that? All right, everybody. Great to see you. Thanks those for the, to those of you who tuned in live. Miss you already. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Bye.